In our previous example, we have learned quite a few interesting details which can be useful for the general proof of convergence in dimensional regularization. In fact, the general proof will, of course, use the example as a blueprint and mimic it just in more generality. Here, I first want to point out two very important general aspects and two features that we will always need to pay attention to. The first one is that we always need to keep very careful track of all the variables that enter our integration. In particular, the T variables appear in certain products uh, in combination with momenta and masses or U variables, and uh, they appear in products both in the integration measure and in the actual integrand, and we need to keep track which product appears at which places. This is, of course, not very deep, but we need to do it very carefully, and uh, T variables appear maybe in different factors uh, in the genuine multi-loop diagrams and in counterterm diagrams. That is one thing that we need to pay attention to. And the other thing is that special functions appear which kind of encapsulate the cancellation of divergencies. We have seen this in the example already several times. And let me just write down once again uh, one of these special functions which has appeared was t to the 2 epsilon minus 1 over 2 epsilon. And this uh, tells you, um, this came from a genuine multi-loop diagram, this came from the counterterm diagram, and this is the way the 1 over epsilon divergence cancels. So it's a non-trivial cancellation, and after the divergence has canceled, there is some remainder which is still depending on epsilon. And before the cancellation happens, we have here some function of t which is non-analytic or discontinuous at uh, t going to zero. And uh, so actually, um, you can um, guess that in the more general case, more such functions will appear. And it is actually quite nice and useful to look at those functions um, separately first before uh, doing the general proof. In fact, that is what I want to do now. It is uh, really simple to look at these functions. It involves only elementary mathematics of the first semester or so. So it's also quite entertaining. And nevertheless, it is far reaching because uh, those functions that we will now discuss are the ones which um, uh, make the cancellation happen in dimensional regularization. So the section title that I want to do now is uh, 362, Special Functions. the core of the cancellation. And we will derive a few simple, but nevertheless quite useful and also interesting and entertaining properties of those functions. This is uh, one of the final results of our example, but it's not the beginning. And so let me now systematize this and tell you exactly how this is all connected. So when we uh, do our loop calculation and the renormalization also in the example, then we started with a one loop calculation. So here in this case, we looked first separately at this one loop diagram, which appeared as a sub diagram. And then we looked at the th behavior of the integrand. Then the uh, non-analytic part of the th behavior was simply this th to the power 2 epsilon. So this was uh, the interesting kind of function of t for this uh, single one-loop diagram which appeared. Okay? And that appeared before the integration. Then we did the integration, extracted some divergence, and we went on. So then we looked at the two-loop case. And the two-loop case involves this two-loop diagram, where this is inserted as a sub-diagram and also the associated counterterm diagram. So then we looked at this 1 minus th operation, which uh, subtracts from this the um, subdivergence, which means that we add to it 
the corresponding counter term, which cancels the divergence of the subdiagram. Well, and uh, then we could do the TH integration, and uh, as the result of the TH integration, this function appeared. So this function does not depend on TH, instead it depends on TG. TG was the uh, other T, the T for the outer loop integration, uh, but nevertheless that was the result of the inner one loop integral. So it was this mismatch. Where did this mismatch come from? It came from the fact that the um, two loop diagram uh, contains the, count, uh, the sub diagram here, and in the sub diagram the TH is always accompanied with TG. So actually, this here is always accompanied with TG to the two epsilon at least in the actual two loop diagram, but it's not accompanied with TG to the two epsilon uh, in isolation. Okay, and uh, so therefore we have this mismatch when we add to the two loop diagram the counter term diagram where this is calculated in isolation. So that is where this came from. So, uh, and actually this is not the only function that appears at this point of the calculation. So there were also some functions just like TG to the two epsilon, uh, which also appeared. So, and this was just the result of the subintegration. Okay, and here we saw the cancellation of the subdivergence. And then we went on and uh, looked at this diagram plus the corresponding counter term and actually thought of doing the TG integral, so the outer loop integration. Then we needed to uh, take into account uh, the result from the subintegration, but we also needed to take into account all the other TG dependencies that arise in the integrand. And uh, then there is in particular an additional TG dependence coming from the integration measure. The integration measure contributes an additional factor TG to the two epsilon. So the non-analytic part, when I say non-analytic, I mean in terms of TG, because that is not analytic in TG at TG equals zero. So this is, uh, or we often, um, called it C infinity, so this is not C infinity at Tg equals zero. So that appears in addition to those factors. So actually the integrand contained really such a combination before doing the Tg integration, and it also contains such a combination. And this is, uh, and then of course the remaining integrand is C infinity in, in this variable, and then using this, we can do the integration and we did that. Uh, then from here we obtained one over four epsilon uh, times something else. Uh, and here my, uh, minus one over two epsilon times something else. And because of that, we obtained some um, resulting divergence. Okay, so there are three steps. First, the isolated uh, one loop calculation with a one loop variable where the integrand contains such a function. And let us now give names to these functions which appear here. Uh, and uh, this will be sets of functions. So here, uh, such a set which appears in the one loop integrand, let us call it J and uh, give it some indices. This is J1, zero, and the one stands for one loop and the zero here stands for uh, no one over epsilon pole. So that is a function. So it's still not um, C infinity at th equals zero, but analytic in epsilon, and, and it does not contain an explicit one over epsilon factor. Okay, then uh, this is the set of functions which appears before the integration. Then this is the fun set of functions which appears after the TH integration and it's a function of the next T variable TG. So this is a different set, let's call it J tilde. And uh, so here there is one function which um, is one loop and contains one explicit one over epsilon. And there is another function which is from one loop but contains no one over epsilon. 
and uh, these function sets will be called j tilde 1 1 and j tilde 0 1. And by the way, let me also add here uh, just the function which is trivial unity. Um, this will help us uh, in setting up a consistent set of sets later on. Okay, so these two would be elements of this j tilde 0 1 with no 1 over epsilon and this is an example of a function j tilde 1 1 with 1 over epsilon. So these are functions which appear after the th integration and they depend on the other t's uh, which remain after the th integration. Then this is a set of functions which is the full integrand for the next loop integration. So it's the integrand of a two loop integration uh, with all the dependencies on the relevant t object. So this will, would be called j without tilde again. So it's before the next loop integration and it's two loop. And then we have here one function which has a one over epsilon pole and another function which two loop and has no one over epsilon pole. And let me add here also for consistency this function here which would also be part of such a set. Okay, So we have three sets of functions and it would go on in this way. You can imagine that uh, next we could do the TG integration and then we would obtain functions which depend if it's a, if this is inserted into a three loop diagram, then uh, this would all be accompanied with the T for the next loop integration. And uh, after the TG is integrated over, we would have such functions or maybe even more complicated functions of the next T. And that would then give rise to G tilde to uh, two maybe and so on. And then we would do the next loop integration and we would obtain a result which is then again a function j3 and so on. Okay, so this is the idea and now let us study those functions in generality. This as I said it's quite simple but nevertheless um, very useful to do. So as a guess we can of course now uh, write down a definition which is hopefully useful. So at the L loop level before doing the L loop integration let's say dt L loop uh, else um, t variable. Before doing that, um, let us look at the behavior of the integral um, or integrand as a function of tl. It would be like this one here or like that one here. Then k is smaller than a, so uh, this is the epsilon power, this is the loop number, there are always fewer 1 over epsilons than the number of loops. So at one loop we have no 1 over epsilon, at two loop we have only 1 over epsilon. And uh, let's give it a name, JKL is the set of functions f of t comma epsilon, which uh, have the following decomposition. In the denominator there is epsilon to the k, and in the numerator there is such a polynomial, namely C1, times t to the 2 epsilon up to cl to the t to the l times 2 epsilon. Okay. So um, each term contains at least one t to, to the 2 epsilon also here, um, but it's a polynomial in t to the 2 epsilon up to the degree uh, of the loop number. So this is the general case. So it's a polynomial in t to the 2 epsilon uh, where there is no constant term, but the uh, smallest term is exactly t to the 2 epsilon, and then it goes up to t to the 2 epsilon to the power of loops. And in the denominator we have just this epsilon to the k. And uh, the requirement is that this function is finite at epsilon equal 0 for all t bigger or equal than 0. This is the case for all these functions. So if t is zero, it's finite um, uh, for all epsilon. 
even at epsilon equals zero, uh, um, point by point. And uh, the same is true in all the other cases. And if t is positive, of course, uh, the same is true. So this is one set. And uh, um, then at the L loop level after the integration, Then there are some functions of the remaining variables. This would be k may be equal to the loop number, and we call the functions j tilde kl is the set of functions f of t comma epsilon which have the decomposition epsilon to the k. And now there is a constant allowed, c0 plus c1 t to the 2 epsilon plus and so on, cl to the t to the l times 2 epsilon. And also this function is required to be finite in the same sense. Okay, so there are two sets of such functions before and after the loop integration. And the single difference is that this contains also a constant. This does not. Otherwise, the sets are the same. So, of course, obviously, uh, this is a subset of the other one. But uh, we keep it separated because uh, the meaning of the sets and their role in our um, iterative loop integration is different. OK, so this is nice. And now let us study these sets. So first, let me again point out these recursive relations. Which are exactly the relations which uh, um, tell us how this appears in the course of the loop calculation. So if we start with some function f um, in this set, kl, then it means this is the integrand of a t-integration. It's the integrand of a t-integration at the L-loop level, and uh, the integrand happens to have epsilon to the k in, in the denominator. So then we do the loop integration. We do the loop integration of this loop variable, and the result is then um, in this new set, f uh, tilde kl, and what can appear as the result of the loop calculation. So one thing that can appear is that this f just remains whatever it is. Um, so maybe uh, this t is accompanied by the next t from the next loop integration, and then at the next level, the same function appears uh, of the new variable. And uh, then it's good to know that this f is uh, also in the next set. Uh, with the same indices, because it's a subset. So that can happen. Another thing that can happen is actually fewer powers of uh, t to the epsilon. So t to the minus 2 epsilon times f. This is also an element of the next set. So as you can see here, because uh, this set allows a constant term. So if we multiply any such function with t to the minus 2 epsilon, then um, it uh, is an element of the next set as well. So these are two ways uh, the function can be modified uh, over this loop integration. And uh, there is a third way, namely by integration. Let's say we integrate from 1 to t over some variable d t prime, t prime of f of t prime comma epsilon. Okay. So this is an integral over such a function. And we will show later that uh, if we do such an integral, then this is also an element of the next set, J, with uh, the index L, but K plus 1. So this is exactly the precise way how the additional poles in epsilon arise in the loop calculation. So um, as we see here from these examples, uh, this is before the loop calculation, this is after the loop calculation. The upper index of the set remains, but there are additional 1 over epsilon poles generated 
And this is such an additional one over epsilon pole which is generated. And uh, this property here, uh, we will prove it in 10 minutes. So this is uh, the loop integration step going from a set to uh, the tilde set. And then the other step is if we uh, have done the loop integration, we are here, uh, then we prepare the integrand for the next loop integration. And then we go from here to here. And uh, what happens here is that we simply need to take into account the other t factors coming from the measure. That is what happens here. And this is essentially trivial because from the measure we just get exactly such a factor t to the 2 epsilon. So if we start with an f in a tilde set, so it's the result of some loop calculation, and we want to prepare the integrand for the next loop, then uh, what simply happens is that this function gets multiplied with t to the 2 epsilon, and that is then automatically an element of the next set j with an increased loop number and the same index k, right? Because if you take any function here, um, which has this form with a constant and goes up to t to the l times 2 epsilon and you multiply with another factor, then there is no constant anymore, but this exponent has increased. So it's an element of such a set, but with one higher index l and the same power of epsilon. So this really corresponds to exactly the structure that we have found. But of course, the point is that this can now go on um, ad infinitum, um, and that is exactly what we need. And so now we can just uh, entertain ourselves by deriving a few very simple but useful properties of uh, these functions. And I will now, for the time being, always assume that uh, we take one function out of this uh, set without tilde, L, K. So that would be like the first function, T to the 2 epsilon, or in the last line, um, so where we do not have this constant in, um, in the integral. And then we derive properties for them, and of course, that automatically gives us also information about the functions in the J tilde sets. Right. So the first property is the following. F of t comma epsilon can be written as a function h to the of t to the 2 epsilon divided by epsilon to the k. So uh, and this h is just the numerator. And what we know about this h is just it's a polynomial. It has no constant term, but it has terms, uh, its argument to the power 1 up to argument to the power L. So it's a very simple polynomial. H of u is equal to C1 times u plus and so on plus CL times u to the L. So that's all. And uh, the second property is now f of t comma zero, if we set epsilon to zero, then what happens? Um, it is given by a constant times logarithm of t um, to the power k. So that's the t dependence of uh, f at zero. How can we prove it? Let me give that as well. So that is quite nice to know. And the proof is simply given by the L'Hopital rule for limits because if we go uh, epsilon to zero, we know that the limit exists because that is the condition on the function. And so if we take the limit, then uh, we can use the L'Hopital rule k times. So we take k times the derivative of the numerator and the denominator. And then in the denominator, we get simply k factorial without any epsilon uh, remaining. And if we take uh, the epsilon derivative in the numerator, then each time 
we get uh, an inner de derivative, which is logarithm of t times 2. That's all. And so if we take the k derivatives of the numerator, we get log t to the power k times uh, some derivative of h. But some derivative of h evaluated at epsilon equals 0, which is some derivative of h evaluated at 1. And whatever it is, it's finite. And uh, therefore, this is uh, then all we need to say. So this is the first interesting property. Now a second interesting property is uh, what I already announced here, namely if we take the integral over a function in J, then we get an element of J tilde. And that will be actually useful in our loop integration. So this is property three. Such an integral, one to t, dt prime over t prime of a function f of t prime comma epsilon is an element of j tilde with an increased epsilon power in the denominator, but the same loop number. Let's also prove it. So the proof is simple. Let's evaluate the integral. The integral is um, given as follows. So we have 1 to t, d t prime over t prime. And uh, OK, we uh, can explicitly write down what we have, sum over some coefficients, cn t prime to the n times n epsilon. Now, what is the integral over t prime to the n times 2 epsilon? So it's a power integral. So uh, combining it with this, we have here t prime to the power n times 2 epsilon minus 1. And the integral, uh, sorry, the integral of this is again just t prime to the power n times 2 epsilon times a constant. And write it like this. The integral is sum over cn times t prime to the power n times 2 epsilon divided, divided by n times epsilon. Uh, well, let me do that again. That is not very nice. Let's do it again, sum over n. And uh, then what is actually the integral? Epsilon to the k, cn. Well, the integral is t prime to the power n minus 2 epsilon. And now let's look at the factors. Let's try to differentiate as usual. So then the um, uh, derivative is n times 2 epsilon times this uh, with the exponent uh, minus 1. So we need to divide by n times 2 epsilon. And then it's correct, and then we put in the limits t, t and 1. OK, but now what do we have here? We have in the denominator 1 power of epsilon more than before. And in the numerator, we have a polynomial up to degree l times 2 epsilon. And the polynomial contains a constant. So that is a function which has all the properties of this J tilde function with k plus 1. Denominator degree is 1 higher. Numerator degree goes from uh, 0 to L. And it is finite because the integrand from the beginning was finite for any value of t and we integrate over a compact interval which does not include at all t equals 0. And therefore, uh, the integral is, of course, also finite in epsilon. So therefore, this is um, established. So that is not difficult to prove. Let me clean the blackboard and let's uh, look at some more simple properties like this. So the next property is actually the converse of this. <coughs> 
the converse is also true. Which means that if you have a function, um, then you can also write it as an integral. So if that is actually only possible, of course, if k is bigger than zero, because uh, by this integration, the exponent in the denominator is increased. So k must be small, uh, bigger than zero, and then our function um, can be written as an integral. So uh, by the way, okay, let's write it t to the two epsilon. e to the 2 epsilon times an integral from 1 to t over d t prime over t prime of some function with the indices k minus 1 and l minus 1 of t prime and epsilon. Okay, now two things have happened. First of all, I said that um, uh, such a function out of the respective j set, if we integrate it, we already know that it gives an element of the j tilde set. We know that from the previous proof. And if we multiply with this, then by definition, uh, we get an element of the j set with these indices. But the point is that any element of our j set can be expressed in this way. So how can we prove this? Let me just write that this is already known, that this gives some element of the set j tilde k l minus 1. And then the multiplication gives some element of our desired set j k l. But whether we can obtain this element is a non-trivial statement. So in order to prove it, Let's do something similar to here, where we uh, explicitly wrote the numerator as a function, namely as a very simple polynomial with this complicated argument, which encapsulates the non-analytic behavior. And here, let's write it uh, in this way. f of t and epsilon is a function t of two uh, to the two epsilon times some function g of t to the two epsilon divided by epsilon to the power k. So this is the way we can write our function because there is no constant term, so we can factor out one such factor, and then this is the remaining polynomial in this argument. So here, this g is the same as h up to one factor of u. g of u contains c1 without u plus and so on, up to cl times u to the power l minus 1. It's like l divided by u. Uh, sorry, like h divided by u. So and about h, we knew from the L'Hopital rule that uh, even the case derivative of h must exist, because otherwise that limit here of the function couldn't exist. And the same is true for a g. So we know, uh, like before, that uh, in order for the limit to exist, the function g must exist and must be zero at um, epsilon equals zero, which means at argument equal one. And also k minus one derivatives of it must be zero. That means uh, this g at argument equal one, this derivative must be zero. Otherwise, it couldn't be true that this function has a finite limit for epsilon going to zero. Okay, so if we know that, then we can write our function f of t comma epsilon in the following way. We have this t to the two epsilon times that, and now we write this in a tricky way. We write it. By the way, um, k is bigger than zero, so that means uh, in particular, we know for sure that the function itself at argument equal one uh, vanishes. That is for sure. And therefore, we can write g um, as g of something minus g of one. 
Okay, and then we can also write it as an integral, namely from 1 to t over dt prime of, now, too yearly, d by dt prime of t of t prime to the 2 epsilon. Okay, so because uh, that integral and differentiation just cancels and gives us g of that minus g of 1, and g of 1 is 0. So therefore, this is a trivial identity, but now we have essentially all the ingredients to bring it into this form. So let us do it. So we have the prefactor t to the 2 epsilon, and then we can just evaluate this derivative using the chain rule. And we have the integral from 1 to t. And uh, and we also got the epsilon to the k here. And we have dt prime epsilon to the k. And uh, what is the chain rule derivative? We have, um, first of all, g derivative with respect to its argument. Then evaluate it at t prime to the 2 epsilon times the inner derivative with respect to t prime gives 2 epsilon times t prime to the 2 epsilon minus 1. Okay, and now we can bring it into this form because the form requires to have dt prime over t prime, and so here the t prime to the minus 1 is useful. So let's write it t to the 2 epsilon times the integral 1 to t dt prime divided by t prime, then 2 divided by epsilon to the k minus 1. So 1 epsilon has cancelled, which uh, is exactly in line with what we want to prove. And what remains is t prime to the 2 epsilon times the derivative g prime of t prime of 2 epsilon. And that's it. That's the proof because what do we have here? Here g prime is the derivative of g with respect to its argument. G is a polynomial. That means if we take a derivative with respect to its argument, we get a polynomial with one degree less. That means the polynomial goes up to u to the l minus 2. That means we get here up to t prime to the 2 epsilon times L minus 2. Together with this, we get a function in the numerator which has no constant, but it's a polynomial in this variable up to uh, 2 epsilon times L minus 1 again. And uh, it's finite, of course, even in the limit epsilon going to 0 by construction because of the L'Hopital rule again. And therefore, this integrand is an element of the required set. So let's just say it like this. This establishes the proof because this combination of functions has all the properties. It has the correct numerator structure and it has uh, the finiteness property because of the logical rule. Very good. So therefore we know, let's again remind ourselves of what we know. We know the behavior at epsilon equals zero. Of course it's finite, but we also know precisely that it gives interesting logarithms of the t variable. We know that uh, if we integrate one j function, we get a j tilde function uh, with one epsilon power more in the number, uh, denominator. Uh, on the other hand, we can represent all of these uh, f's as an integral of some lower f's. All of that is useful. And now let us come to a fifth property. The fifth property is quite tricky, but uh, you can guess that it is very useful for us in the general renormalization proof, because what we always have is that our t variables are accompanied with the remaining t variables or the other t variables from the higher loops. Okay, so we always have this combination of t times xi, where xi summarizes all the other t's. And therefore, uh, you can expect that uh, such products will actually appear in the functions. That is not very nice for us because if we want to do a t-integration, 
then this is disturbing and we don't want to integrate, for example, something like this, t to the 2 epsilon times psi to the 2 epsilon minus 1 over 2 epsilon. If we integrate that over t, it's uh, difficult. We want to integrate only this over t. That is what we want. And therefore, what we like to have is some separation of variables, like in differential equations or quantum mechanics. So let's separate the variables, and that is actually possible. So that can be written as a sum over some j index. And then we have products of functions. F1 j, which only depends on psi and epsilon, and F2j, which only depends on p and epsilon. And all of these functions here are still finite. So a finite function of a product can be represented as sums of products of finite functions. So all of these are elements of J, uh, L, K, uh, I, J. And um, so what I mean here is that all these functions have the same L. L1j is equal to L2j equal to uh, the original loop number. But the epsilon powers, they multiply. So uh, here we have some certain epsilon power, k. And then uh, each function here has an epsilon power which multiplies in the according way. So k is given as the sum k1j plus k2j. And so this is a non-trivial sum of several such terms. But each term has this property. Okay? So this is always uh, possible. That's a separation of variables. So this is again a very nice and useful property for us. Let us prove it. Let me get rid of this proof here to make space for the next proof. Right. So let us prove this property five. First of all, it is trivial for k equal 0, uh, which means we don't have a 1 over epsilon pole. Because if we don't have a 1 over epsilon pole, uh, this function here is just a linear combination of terms like psi times t to the power 2 epsilon. And then each individual term has already this structure, because each individual term is obviously a product and each term in the product uh, is finite on its own, and uh, therefore this is a um, tri trivial statement. The only non-trivial statement is if we have cancellations between different terms uh, because we have a 1 over epsilon in the denominator. So let us do an induction, prove it uh, step by step for higher and higher loop numbers, but uh, let us assume um, that k is non-zero. So first of all, let's assume the statement to be true for L minus 1. And now we want to consider a case where k is positive. So we really have a 1 over epsilon pole. And we can rely on the statement for lower loop numbers. Then. We start by writing down our function f of xi times t and epsilon. And what we do now is the previous statement. We have proven that we can relate our f in, uh, with a certain loop number and a certain k to f with a smaller loop number and a smaller k. And of course, that was also only possible for if k. Otherwise, uh, there is no need to do anything. And so we now have positive k, so we can reduce our f to smaller f's or simpler f's, for which we know by assumption uh, our statement. Good. So 
psi times t overall to the 2 epsilon times an integral from 1 to t times psi dt prime over t prime of some function f k minus 1 l minus 1 of t prime and epsilon. Okay, this is what we now uh, know. And now comes an ingenious but an extremely simple trick. What is this ingenious trick? I didn't invent it, but uh, what is this trick? We can write the integral from 1 to a product over dt prime over t prime. We can write it as a sum of two integrals, namely from 1 to t only, plus an integral from t to t times psi. Right? Then we have here something which only depends on t and there is no dependence on psi at all. So we have already managed to factorize somehow. So this is absolutely independent of psi. This depends on psi and t. However, we can now do a substitution and replace the integration variable t prime by t times t prime. And then we have fully absorbed the t and then our new integration variable t prime only goes from 1 to psi. And then we have again separated t and psi and here we have something which essentially only depends on psi. So let us apply this trick or this idea to this integral here and see what happens. So therefore our f of the product t times psi and epsilon is now the following. So if we directly uh, do the step, then this part of the integral, if we apply it here, then this gives us again our function f, because the function f is represented by the integral, but now the upper limit is t, therefore what we get is our function at the value t instead of t times psi. But the definition involves also this factor here, so we shouldn't forget that. Therefore, in the beginning we have psi times 2 epsilon times f of t and epsilon. So this function here contains now this integral and that t to the 2 epsilon. So that is the first result. And then the second result is, let's write it down, psi times t to the 2 epsilon times our integral and the integral is now an integral from 1 to psi integration variable dt prime over t prime and the integrand is our function f k minus 1 and l minus 1 with the argument because of the substitution um, t times t prime comma epsilon. Okay, so here enters our t still. Now just to notice this is an element of our set j. Uh, with k equal 1, so without epsilon pole. This is an, uh, our original function, so it's an element of our set j. So this is already fully in line with what we want, because we have a product of two functions. Both functions depend only on one single variable. The loop number is the same as before, uh, and uh, the sum of the 1 over epsilon powers adds up to k, because here we have 1 over epsilon to the k, here we have no 1 over epsilon. So this is already one term like this, fully in line with our expectation. But now let's look at the second term. Let's look at the second term. So the second term has now here a function of lower degree and for that we can use our induction assumption and therefore uh, we can use here such a separation of variables. So we have psi times t to the 2 epsilon times the sum over j, integral 1 to psi, d t prime over t prime. And now we have here some sum f 1 j, uh, which only depends on so t and t prime, which only depends on t prime and epsilon, and another function which only depends on t and epsilon. <coughs> 
And now the indices of these two functions correspond to those ones here. So they add up uh, in the numer denominator to k minus 1 and the uh, 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 loop number is l minus 1. Good, but now we have separated the thing because this integral here ends here because that is independent of our integration variable. So here we have a function which only depends on t. This is an element of our set uh, with so let's let's okay let's write it completely. So the t dependence comes from here, t t to the two epsilon times this function. This function has loop number l minus one and uh, um, epsilon index k j. Multiplied with this, we get something with loop number l. So this has. Um, loop number L and index K to J. And it's of course an element of the respective J set because uh, by construction. On the other hand, we have here the Xi dependence. Here is our Xi dependence. That gives a function of Xi. So this is uh, first of all an element of a J set. And if we integrate it, we get something of the J tilde set. If we multiply it with chi, chi to the 2 epsilon, we get something in the j set once again. And so the index here was first of all um, the loop number L minus 1. And then we integrate and multiply, so we get chi L minus 1 plus 1, so we get L, which is the desired loop number. And the 1 over epsilon power is increased by the integral, and therefore the 1 over epsilon power is whatever we have here, k1 j plus 1. Now, we uh, have two functions, sum over two functions with these indices, and that matches precisely our statement, because in the end, the loop numbers of all these functions which arise are, <laughs> are L, and uh, the epsilon indices add up to, um, to uh, First of all, here to k minus 1, and because of that plus 1, they add up to precisely k. And that is exactly our statement. Right, so let us uh, make a one minute break. Okay, a uh, small surprise here, um, but nothing to worry about. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's go on. So we have proved our fifth property, which was the separation of variables property. And uh, so that will, of course, be very useful. I will just prove one additional property which is even simpler than the previous ones, but which is also um, obviously useful. And uh, then we have achieved our full understanding of this set of functions. Okay, so the sixth, prop uh, one. The sixth property is just a product rule. Namely, if you have two functions, with some indices k1, l1, um, and an other index k2 and l2, but of the same arguments this time, then of course uh, this is an element of the set with uh, the obvious indices l1 plus l2 and k1 plus k2, because in the denominator we just get the product of the epsilons, epsilon to the k1 times epsilon to the k2, so this is the appropriate index. And in the numerator, we have a product of two polynomials with these degrees. So we get a polynomial with the sum of the degrees. So this is obvious. Why could that be useful? Could be useful because uh, these functions are the functions which arise in our loop integration. And uh, let us imagine we do a loop integration with such a loop diagram then uh, the result of this might be such a function. Then we might do another loop integral that gives such a function. And uh, then we prepare our integration of the free loop integral, which would be the overall free loop diagram, which contains the previous two as sub diagrams. Then from the previous two integrations, we might get, uh, let's say, our t3 variable for the third loop, 
appears in both of these subloops. Therefore, our T3 will appear naturally in such a product form f of T3 times f of T3. Therefore, we need to integrate over such a product of our T3 variables. And therefore, it is good to know that the product of such functions is again such a function of this class and all our properties also apply to such a product. So these properties that we have established right now form the core of our cancellation of divergences in dimensional regularization. And using these properties, we can really simplify our proof. And uh, just to end the lecture, let me again schematically go through the procedure as it will now unfold when we do the loop integration. So let us, let us imagine we do the loop integration, we have a graph, and then what we need to do is we need to apply the first subtraction operator, 1 minus t1 acting on this. Then afterwards we apply 1 minus t2 acting on the result. Then 1 minus t3 acting on the result and so on and so forth. And each uh, step involves actually two sub-steps. First, uh, by looking at this, we need to look at the behavior of the integrand as a function of our integration variable t1. Then we integrate over it and get a result. Then we prepare the integration over t2. Look at the integrand. Then we do the integration and get a result. Then we prepare the integration of t3 do the integration and get the result. So there are always two steps and they correspond precisely to the two sets of functions that we have introduced. So let's uh, write this down a little bit so that you get an overview of the proof um, of the cancellation of divergences that uh, you can now very nicely imagine. So first we prepare this one minus T1 operation, which means we have an integrand of one integration variable and uh, the integrand will be an element of the set J10. So we have one loop and uh, so far we have no one over epsilon divergence in the integrand. And uh, the variable will be T1. Uh, and uh, so the only example of such a function would be T1 to the 2 epsilon. Then. Actually, this is uh, accompanied by also all the other t's. So whenever uh, this t1 to the 2 epsilon appears, also all the other t variables of which this is a subdiagram will also appear to the same power. And when we do the integration, we might want to separate the variables. Uh, so let's say separate the variables. so that we isolate our dependence on the variable t1. Then we do the integration. And uh, then we obtain a result. Then we have a result which we obtain after uh, all of these steps, separate variables, do the loop integration, do the subtraction. And then our result is an element of the set J1 tilde with index either 1 or 0. And the variables in the result are not T1 anymore, but uh, the other Ts, for example, T2. So uh, an example would be T2 to the 2 epsilon minus 1 over 2 epsilon, or all the other examples of those functions here. So this is then the second step. Then, this is not the full integrand for our uh, T2 integration because uh, then there are some additional factors from the measure. So we prepare our 1 minus T2 uh, operation, which means we combine the result of the first loop with the measure from the next loop and then we obtain an integrand which is an element of this J1 or 0 with index 2, and that would be the product of this, for example, 2 t2 to the 2 epsilon times what we had before, 
but also other stuff. And uh, that would be again accompanied maybe with uh, the other T variables, T3, T4, and so on. So this would also be mixed inside of this. Therefore, the next step, we cannot uh, directly do the integral over T2. We first need to separate variables again. So let's separate variables. Then we can do the T2 integration and obtain a result, which is then a result after 1 minus T2. And this result will be a function J2, 2, 2 one or zero and it will be a function of t3 and this could for example be t3 uh, to the 2 epsilon uh, excuse me so this is j tilde so it can contain one over epsilon square so it could be for example this t3 to the 2 epsilon minus one divided by epsilon square and also the numerator is square so then this combination is again analytic in epsilon, if epsilon goes to zero, but it has here formally a double pole in epsilon. So such functions can appear at the next level. And so on. So it, always this uh, sequence of two steps, prepare the integrand, then uh, separate variables, do the integration, and get the result, then prepare the next integrand, separate variables, do the integration, and so on. And so step by step, always this sequence of functions will appear. And now we have established all the necessary properties of these functions and therefore um, our treatment of the full proof will now be simplified and you will rediscover how this all appears with all the extra details which appear uh, when we look at the full integral with, with everything. Let me just uh, give one remark in the paper by Brighton, Lona, Meison. Um, these uh, sets also appear with the same um, name, but they mean something else. There the sets are defined specifically for the graphs. So for each Feynman diagram, the sets might look differently, but I just summarized the set and uh, it, for me it only depends on the loop number and uh, the epsilon power and that is sufficient for the proof. Okay, so this ends this lecture here and then the next time we will complete uh, the full proof as already announced several times.